We turn in the scriptures, brothers and sisters, to Mark chapter 15, and we'll be reading verses 33 to 47. Mark 15, 33, this is the word of God. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage. And went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud. And Joseph bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. And thus far, the reading of God's holy word. The text for this morning's sermon, Mark chapter 15, verse 38. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will open for me the gates of heaven? Some years ago, a friend of mine who was a reformed pastor in Quebec, he was sitting at the bedside of his mother. She was dying. She was a lifelong Roman Catholic. And she asked him that question. She, was, she lay dying. Who will open for me the gates of heaven? That's where Roman Catholicism and every false religion fails. Every false religion deprives fallen sinners of any hope. Every false gospel is a crushing burden upon the sinner that you have to find the answer within yourself, that you have to find a way back to God and into heaven. But this morning, the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ comes to us in our text as we see our Lord Jesus Christ in the triumph of his crucifixion, opening for us the door of heaven. Now, often on Good Friday, we, we dwell, and rightly so, we dwell on the, the payment of sin, the suffering of our Savior, as he, as he carries the burden of God's wrath against our sin. And in the last Sundays leading up to Good Friday, we've been focusing on those aspects of Golgotha, of the cross. Today, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the victory doesn't wait for Easter Sunday. But that victory and the triumph which is displayed and proclaimed to the whole world already begins today on Good Friday. Now, as we look at our text which, and the context which we've read, it doesn't look like much of a victory. 
We see waves of judgment crushing our Savior. And we see, as it always does, that the judgment of God upon sin exposes the results of sin. Sin uncreates. Sin rolls back the goodness of God in creation. It perverts it. We see that in the flood in Noah's time as to cleanse the world from evil and as a judgment upon sin, God rolls back the creation days to the third day. The the waters cover the earth. He undoes what he did in those first days of creation there in Genesis chapter 1 as judgment. But here on Golgotha, he goes further. He rolls it back to day one. Thick darkness covers the earth. Everything points to uncreation, to undoing, as our Lord is crucified on a dead tree, and his soul is torn from his body in the undoing of the creation of man. His body soon to be returned to the earth and the spirit to God who gave it. And so as we look here at our Savior suffering on the cross on Golgotha, it seems that all is undone. But our Lord doesn't think so. You see what he does there in verse 37. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. That's important. It's the ninth hour. As the final sacrifice of the day is being offered in the temple, that last evening sacrifice. And it is at this moment that Christ gets to the very end and the very depth of his sufferings as he cries out there in verse 34, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he drinks that, that last, those last drops of the cup of God's wrath and he finishes it. And then things happen very quickly. He says, and we know that from the other gospels, he says, I thirst and he receives moisture to moisten his lips and his mouth so he can speak clearly those last words from the cross. He gathers what little remaining strength he has. And then in verse 37, he utters a loud cry. And we know from the other gospels what he cried. It is finished. And then he says, right on following that, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is finished. That is a cry of victory. This is not the last whimper of a dying man who has failed. But this is a cry of victory, that the penalty of sin has been paid, that the guilt of sin has been removed, that God's righteous wrath and judgment on sin has been satisfied. And for whom? For us. When Jesus cries out with a loud voice, it is finished. He's talking about you, beloved. That cry of victory is about you. That your debt and your guilt and your condemnation are all gone. Paul says to the, to the Colossians chapter 2, 14, God canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And then verse 15, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him, or we can translate in in it, in the cross. And so we have here on the cross victory. We have victory over sin, victory over judgment, victory over hell, Victory over death. Jesus takes the sting out of death, which is sin. 
And there on the cross, we have victory over all the gathered hordes of the kingdom of darkness, from the smallest demon to Satan himself, as Jesus crushes the head of the serpent. In those hours of darkness, as God's wrath crushed him, all the powers of hell were assailing him at the same time. And now it's done. It's finished. And then in a deliberate, intentional act of laying down his life, Jesus gives up his spirit. It's right at the end of the day's temple sacrifices. This is a decision Christ makes. He has the power to lay down his life and the power to take it up again. This is a sovereign act. He is not a passive victim. He chooses the time and the place to die. And he tears his soul from his body. And his spirit ascends to the presence of the Father. And his broken, bruised, bloodied body is left lifeless, hanging on that cross. And even as he tears his soul from his body, our text happens, verse 38. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Why? Why does the Holy Spirit draw our attention to that? Well, we need to know something about that curtain in order to understand what's happening here. This is the curtain of the temple. This is Herod's temple, one of the greatest architectural wonders of the ancient world, on par with what is later built, the Colosseum, or on par with what was already built, the Parthenon, the Acropolis there in Athens. Massive temple complex, one of the greatest religious complexes in the ancient world, 36 acres. And the temple itself that Herod built or rebuilt, far larger than Solomon's. Solomon's got up to about 50 feet. Herod's temple soared about 150 feet into the air, about 15 stories high. If you've ever been to Paris and you've seen the Arc de Triomphe, that's kind of the idea of the size we're looking at as you stand in front of the holy place and, and look up. It's about the same size, about the same height. And that curtain, that curtain between the holy of holies and the holy place, about 60 feet high and about 30 feet wide. Now, I had some emails back and forth with some of the former building committee this week, and 60 feet high is about three times from the floor to the ceiling. Multiply that by another two, and you've got how high that, 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 that curtain was. If you go outside and look at the cross on top of the church, that's a, a little over 40 feet, so you have to add half as much again to get to the height just of the curtain of the Holy of Holies. About five or six stories high. And it was massive. And it was very thick. What was it doing there? What was the purpose of this curtain? Well, back in the Old Testament when the tabernacle was first made, which was a movable temple, and then later on the Temple of Solomon, the tabernacle, the Temple of Solomon, the temple was a representation of the world. And the Holy of Holies was a representation of the Garden of Eden, the place where man can have communion with God. And so the tabernacle later on the temple had all kinds of fruits and, and all kinds of trees and all kinds of things which evoked a garden, remembering Eden. And the Holy of Holies then would represent Eden, the place where you can have communion with the presence of God on earth, the place where man and God can meet together and walk together. But the, the curtain said, listen, you can't come in here anymore. You have been exiled from the garden. The cherubim were embroidered on the curtain, and those cherubim are the guardians of God's holiness. And those cherubim said to sinners, stay out. No sinner may approach a holy God. It's what Isaiah says in chapter 59 of his prophecy, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Now this curtain, we, we have an idea of what it looked like from the scriptural, the biblical text, and also 
uh, historians uh, at that time, including Josephus, the famous Jewish historian. We know from Exodus chapter 26, which says this, you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. That was the tabernacle curtain. The, the massive curtain in Jesus' time was in those same colors, blue, purple, scarlet, and then the color of undyed linen. And it represented the created world, the created universe. We have in those colors the four elements, air, water, fire, earth, the blue representing the air, the purple, the sea, the scarlet, the fire, and the fine linen, the earth. And in Jesus' time, we don't know for sure, but it's quite possible we have some indications that also stars were worked into this curtain, representing the heavens. And so what's the idea here? The idea is that to get into the presence of God, you have to pass through the heavens. That paradise isn't on this earth, but access to God requires passing through the heavens. Now, this curtain was ripped from top to bottom as a sovereign act of Jesus Christ. As he cries out, it is finished, he tears the curtain. And he destroys the barrier between us and a holy God. He opens the door to heaven, to paradise. Didn't he say that to the thief next to him on the cross? Today, you will be with me in paradise. You can imagine the shock and horror of the priests as they brought their final sacrifice and went into the temple as the last act of the day to bring the incense before that curtain when suddenly that curtain gave way and ripped from top to bottom, revealing what? Revealing nothing. The Holy of Holies was an empty space at the time of Jesus. There was no ark. There was no golden, massive golden cherubim over the ark. They had been long gone for centuries already. There was nothing there. As Jesus cries out, as it is finished, he shows the emptiness of the Old Testament ceremonies and rituals. They are evacuated of all significance because the sacrifice to end all sacrifices has been made. The blood, which really pays for sin, has been shed. And this is what Hebrews 4 verse 14 says as it explains to us what it means when Jesus cried out, it is finished. Hebrews 4, 14, since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The door is open. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. No one can come to the Father except through me. And then we turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, where the apostle says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. This is the triumph of the crucifixion. That the door of heaven is open. That we can come back home again to the Father. There is no barrier. There is no cherubim with a flaming sword barring the way and separating sinners from a holy God. There's no one saying, stop, Go back, turn around, no entrance. But now what stands between us and a holy God is the flesh of Christ, his body broken for us. At every Lord's Supper, we see the the minister breaking that bread, tearing that piece of bread into two, reminding us that it is through the victory 
of the broken, crucified body of Christ, that we may come to the Father, that we may sit at table with God's royal family, that you, believer, belong. The door is open to you. The lights are on, the table is set, the feast is ready, and washed in the waters of baptism and clothed in the pure, royal, festive robes of Christ's righteousness, washed in the blood of the Lamb, you are welcome. Behold, beloved, he has set before you an open door, and nothing and no one can shut it. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing can disqualify you. Nothing can stop you. Nothing can keep you out. Nothing can tell you, turn around, go back. You don't belong here. Nothing. Not all of your sins. Not all of your unworthiness. All of your shame. All of your guilt. Nothing can stop you if you will only come in faith, in Christ, and through Christ. And as we come, we worship. Worthy is the Lamb, for he was slain for us. Worthy is the Lamb. You have redeemed us with your blood. You have set the prisoners free. You have made us kings and priests to God, and we shall reign with thee. Amen.